Hi guys, welcome to another episode of the Marine Bio Movie Club. We are really happy to have you. This week we are going to be discussing The Cove. Uh, which is a documentary that was done in, I believe, 2009. It actually won an Oscar, um, but it's essentially about the Taiji dolphin slaughter. And that's something that we've sort of briefly mentioned through covering other documentaries. But in this documentary in particular, um, we're looking at it from sort of, I guess, probably one of the first like public media of the actual event itself yeah do you have sort of like a history with the documentary i watched it in high school when i was a senior so in like 2017 um because my thesis advisor told me to because i was originally going to do a whole like paper about captivity uh didn't do that i did one about um power complexes in humans but you know it's fine you know, kind of but a related I, issue totally yeah it will it, it like phased off of it and so yeah I, when I watched the cove and I was like oh but I, I knew about the Taiji drives before the cove so nothing in it was truly like as shocking anymore because everything in it is now like on Instagram yeah but at the time it was really shocking yeah I remember the first time I watched it actually it was the only time I watched it prior to recently just re-watching it Um, We were on a bus ride for a swim team like travel trip and I have a feeling that the person that put this movie on in the bus was not aware (laughs) that this is what the movie was about. I think they saw the cover where it's like a dolphin jumping and they're like yeah pretty dolphin movie you know yeah and so I remember everyone in the bus ride I remember being like truly like wow like this is insane and everyone else is like why are we watching this like <laughs> kind of thing um but when I just now rewatched it, it was kind of the first time I'd really like watched it since having my degree and things like that I watched it with a friend and they definitely still already knew about Taiji but like were probably a lot more shocked by it I think than I guess I was I've kind of sort of gotten to the point nowadays where I feel like I'm really desensitized to a lot of (laughs) yeah the horrible stuff that goes on in our ocean Um, yeah well I've had friends who are like cove monitors now and like you have two and like the footage that's in the movies now just like posted on Instagram and honestly the footage that's in the movies at the time was extremely groundbreaking but now is honestly kind of mild yeah it's like the so. daily dolphin project posts when there's a slaughter. That's like yeah. the, the footage that they share. But it did definitely, I think at the time, bring up this sort of idea that this was actually going on and a lot of people didn't know about it. Oh yeah. I do have a problem with the documentary, however, because it is really anti-Asian culture. Um, yeah. Which it's hard because you're walking this sort of like fine line where obviously this is where this issue is occurring and it is tied into the culture in that area because that's the claim they're sort of making to quantify why they're doing it. Um, But I think the documentary, although they did mention that the majority of Japan didn't even know this was happening or didn't know necessarily that the meat that they were consuming is from Taiji, I think the documentary still really kind of focuses on Japan as the issue and yes they are definitely a nation where whaling is still a huge problem Um, but it's definitely something that just keep that in mind like when you're watching the documentary that there is this sort of like sentiment behind it that try and step I don't know I it's hard because you want to still express that yes this is where this is occurring this is the reasons that they're claiming it's okay but that that's not necessarily the country as a whole. And I think they yeah. can maybe emphasize that a little bit more in the documentary. I read a couple like, not like rebuttals, but blogs from people who have like talked about the movie. Cause I've had friends be like, oh, I don't love it. Like it's a good show. But like when you, when we're looking back at it now, it's like, eh, not, 
not the best. It's kind of mm-hmm. like that gotcha journalism again. But part of it too is on the note of like tradition when Rick O'Berry was kind of being like, it's not, a tra- it's not a real tradition. It only happens here. There's the whole thought of like tradition doesn't necessarily mean the entire country. Mm-hmm. And like, I think like my family, um, I grew up going to like a very uh, cowboy-esque place every summer and that's where like cattle drives and right. and branding is like a town event and we'd right. all go watch and I'm pretty sure people who are not from those areas like we're very surprised that it was like a cookout we're all watching these calves get like pushed over and yeah burned with a brand and it seems like barbaric but that's a tradition in those areas and that was something I read in a blog where they were like it's tradition for that town it right. may not be tradition for the entire country of Japan yeah and I think unfortunately especially when they're discussing issues with like IWC is that you've got this problem where the people that are doing it are claiming it's tradition or it's culture when it's not necessarily the entire the culture of the entire nation to your point yeah well Um, yeah and then like it it doesn't always excuse like the the blog I read was like I'm not excusing it saying it's okay to do because it's like for culture but the note on tradition or cult or like whatever it's okay like if they say it is their tradition because it could be where they are doesn't make it okay and they do mention that dolphin slaughters happened in other areas of Japan previously that have since stopped because one, because there's no more dolphins, yeah. um, but two, because of other issues that were associated with it and that, yeah, now we're kind of moving into this different sort of area in Taiji where that's occurring more often. They talk a little bit just about, and Rico Berry especially talks about his involvement in like captivity and dolphin training and how that sort of was his start. And he fully admits, he's like, I captured the dolphins for Flipper. Mm -hmm. um and sort of explains his change of heart and I wrote down notes about like the self-awareness that dolphins have and their individuality which I know is something we've briefly discussed in covering other documentaries as well just how intelligent they are um but I thought that the documentary brought it up in a kind of a different perspective as like how can you see this intelligence and then also be okay with the living standards that they're in I guess yeah and it was less sciencey because I feel like in other films it's like we know it's been proven that they're self-aware through mirror tests mm-hmm. through different like like scanning their brains and brain activity but his was just like a very personal experience that yeah he had it was the dolphin more like this is what I saw mm-hmm. in my life you know and they sort of talk about it at the very end of the documentary as well when they're talking to the um OSP representative and scientist where he's saying as a scientist I'm taught to look at cognitive ability based on like tool use and like all these measurable factors but also still mentioning there's just something about being in the water and making eye contact with that animal that is an emotional reaction you can't separate it you know from the science I guess if that makes sense. No, it does, yeah. And we both have had that experience, mm-hmm. you know. So I die with dolphins. Yeah, and so I can. I mean, I can attest for even just recently having a really amazing dolphin interaction, and I wrote about it in the post that I made. But as much as I love sharks and love when sharks approach me, there is something different about when a cetacean, whether it be pilot whales or bottlenose or whatever it is looks at you and chooses to approach you that is entirely different than any other animal yeah like there's just an extra level of intelligence and awareness and emotion that is behind that animal that you like it's hard to explain and put it into words for someone that hasn't actually experienced that you know yeah I know it is and that's something they did kind of bring up later on um that I Asterisk in here, Rico Berry said something like, you have to see them in the wild to understand why captivity doesn't ex- doesn't work. Yeah. And that Which- was something that I think really struck a chord with me. And I'm sure with you as well, just because we've talked about it previously, but we both have paths of supporting captivity and even arguing, arguing for captivity in some sense. 
prior to more research and education and things like that. But I think for me, even up until the point where I did see dolphins in the wild, it didn't really actually, like I understood the concept of this is wrong. We shouldn't keep an animal in a cage that's meant to travel miles a day. And that, like, I understood the science or the like logic behind it, but I don't think even for me until seeing dolphins in the wild and interacting with dolphins in the wild that it really actually clicked like how screwed up it is yeah essentially but yeah it definitely it's very different when you see it I know for me it was the bottlenose on big island and I've only ever seen bottlenose in captivity and Mm -hmm just when you're I was looking at the dolphin and then it's little pod and then there's just like no walls which was what was weird and happy for me and I was Mm -hmm. like yeah there's nothing that's stopping this dolphin that doesn't mean like they are traveling a hundred thousand like however many miles a day they can stick to one area but they have that option and that movement and that there aren't barriers which was very emotional yeah for me to see and even outside of just the barrier idea I think seeing them move freely in their environment and making the choice I get like one of the things that is argued I think a lot in captivity is that the animals have a choice whether they want to do the behaviors asked of them or not and I think sure to some degree that is true at least maybe more so nowadays than it used to be now that they do all receive the same amount of food by the end of the day and all that kind of stuff that we've talked about previously, especially when discussing blackfish. The the difference in a wild animal saying, hey, I want to come closer and get a closer look at you and potentially interact with you versus an animal that, like there was no incentive. That dolphin that came up the other day- yeah, that dolphin. Like, the dolphin can choose to interact with you, but sometimes they will be told to. So you never like, like, do you really know? You know, yeah. and are and yeah. So I, I mean, I probably fall somewhere in the middle. Where yes, technically, like nowadays we're not using negative reinforcement or whatever it is, but you're also still incentivizing that animal to do something that like you want from it. You mm-hmm. know. Whereas a wild animal that's never had that incentive, there's something a lot more pure about an interaction with that wild individual than something in captivity as magical as it could possibly be, you know? Yeah. But yeah. And then they bring up Miami Sea Aquarium and I was just like, the we worst. all know how we feel. The worst. <laughs> about Miami Sea Aquarium. It's just such a screwed up. Place. I'm trying yeah. not to use actual bad words they're horrible <laughs> they're pretty effed up yeah Rick was talking about how yeah the last straw for him was when Kathy essentially committed suicide in his arms mm-hmm. because they talk about how dolphins and whales have to actually cognitively think to breathe whereas humans we just kind of like obviously you can think about breathing and change how you're breathing and all that sort of thing but we just sort of do it yeah um and they have to cognitively think and I wanted to hear more about that because I I don't know if I ever really thought about it to be honest um it doesn't surprise me that that's the case because they live in an environment where they're probably not breathing majority of the time realistically but from what you know about like dolphins and whales like I'm assuming this is true, but do you like to how much degree of that do you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, the term like suicide, I it just, I feel like I was like, mm, yeah, no, yeah, no. Yeah. My reaction to it, I was like, I mean, you can't say I wasn't there yeah, and I didn't know the health condition of the dolphin, but it was all, like other things could totally be why a dolphin died. It like, she could have stopped breathing just because like something was happening and yeah. you stop breathing when you die and you obviously everyone takes a last breath including a whale or a dolphin right so that was part of it I was like but I don't know if there's even I didn't look it up but I don't know if there's like an autopsy report saying if there's anything else going on 
um, it totally could be like a suicide, but it's one of those things where I feel like there's potentially a danger of like over anthropomorphizing, having a relationship with the individual. And there could have been other factors happening and she just took a last breath and died and wasn't a suicide. It, yeah. it, I wonder if there's like suicide rates because most cetacean suicides that have happened where we put quote suuicide on it have been with bashing where they are bashing. Mm. So for example, um, like self-mutilation. Yeah, so there were two orcas at Miami Seaquarium prior to now. Lolita's or Tokite's only one, but her mm-hmm. partner, I want to say his name's Hugo, um, died because he would repeatedly ram his head into a wall and he ended up dying due to that. It's, it's kind of noted that that could be a form of suicide. It could also just be like excessive self-mutilation that led to his yeah. death. Mm-hmm. He may not have been doing it to actively kill himself, um, but that's, either way it clearly yeah. shows distress in some form yeah. or another those are generally the the ones where suicides thrown around now mostly because there aren't trainers that are like the dolphin commits suicide in my arms <laughs> right and i part of me believes that like rick knew that animal extremely mm-hmm. well so part of me is kind of like well you know if that's what you think happened chances are like yeah, it could, it could, and it, like, you know, yeah. that animal. So it's very possible that that is true. I do agree with you that like the term suicide in this case is definitely a strong one to use. And he does kind of mention that he's like, you may be thinking suicide, you know, yeah, like, that kind of thing. Um, but I just thought it was interesting. I'm like, well, yeah, duh. They have to think about breathing. You know? <laughs> like, yeah that sort of thing but um I didn't love his immediate reaction afterwards yeah I I his here's he's what I will he's, say about he's been a part he yeah. has been cited as um not that he's killed dolphins but his actions have killed dolphins he's been trying to save yeah. and that's where he gets a lot of controversy which is merited because as his footage was showing a lot of it was very reckless attempts at freeing cetaceans right which I'm all for. I was watching the footage kind of going like, mm. yeah, one for him, because clearly like, especially the one where he's like on Navy property, I'm like, boy, you are just asking to get shot. Yeah. I was like, mm. kind of thing. I couldn't um, do that. You're but very also great. I was sort of cringing because, and we've sort of discussed this again when we were discussing Blackfish, but the idea of releasing previously captive animals and sort of the controversy I guess that's involved in that like can they survive after being raised in captivity will their instincts take over Mm -hmm. they're too conditioned to humans like all these sorts of factors that play a role in that you know but I will give I will give Rick props he is a passionate man yes and 100%. he's not afraid to do whatever it takes to get his point across. Whether it's the smartest or the most reasonable mm-hmm. solution, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah. But he clearly cares an immense amount about this cause and is willing to do whatever he feels he can to help it yeah Um, well dolphin project does much better with rehabilitation now they actually have sanctuaries in certain areas for dolphins so when they do get dolphins that are released that they're like given mm -hmm. properly they put them in these areas they don't just outward like release them the other question that i was going to talk to you about it was something that the friend i was watching brought up um is there a because i know we've talked about like sea pens and things as a possibility but realistically, like when it comes to captive dolphins, at least the solutions that we have now, is it primarily let's rehome this animal in a hopefully better environment for the rest of their life versus like actually releasing them? Is that it should the be rehoming. I don't think it should be released for anything unless it is like a recently caught animal we can track their pod and give them back Mm -hmm. it should always be rehab not rehab well I guess it's kind of rehab 
and just rehoming. There is Luna, the Southern resident killer whale. And then there was Keiko. Keiko didn't get hit. Luna got hit. Keiko died from pneumonia. But Keiko okay. was Free Willy who was actually released got it. from captivity into the wild. Mm-hmm. And his story is, I've posted about it and said, like, this story is proof enough. I feel like for people, it should be that release, release is maybe not the isn't best. very viable because he was reliant upon human care for a long time. There's footage even of him potentially getting attacked by wild killer whales. Like he wasn't mm-hmm. accepted. He back into the pod. Yeah. Yeah. People were saying like, there's couple, there's footage of him with them. There's a video of him getting like bitten by another whale. There's a ton of evidence. He was always hanging out in fjords with yeah. um, humans. And it, they actually had to, like tell people they had to stop touching him because he loved to be like ridden and played with by like kids and whatnot. Then he died of pneumonia after yeah. like two years. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's sort of the challenge, right, is like what's considered the amount of time where release maybe is acceptable, po- yeah. like how much well, time we're waiting, initial capture. We're waiting on like confirmation with the nine killer whales that were captured in Russia and that were released. Mm-hmm. A couple of them have been documented back with their pods, but haven't seen them since just because the Russia Orca project, there are a lot of killer whales in a lot of space that they can't track all the it's time. It's not as easy. Yeah. So for all we know, like some of those individuals may not have made it, but they were very freshly caught that that was a good option was to let Mm -hmm. them release them. And I think for Rick to like defend him doing what he did partially, a lot of these animals probably were like, well, he wild it was a, caught. It was a long time ago. It was a long time ago. Wild that. caught. They could have even been in the same areas where they were caught because catching yeah. happened in places like Florida that where he released he did get sued a couple times for what he did. Oh, he, I mean, he was talking about in the documentary how he went to jail. Yeah, but he, they were released. There were a couple of the ones he released that got injured in the process, but like they probably, they likely could have very well been from that area, wild born, who knows how old they were when they're caught. Cause even in Taiji, they don't always take babies. They just take right. pretty ones. Cause unlike killer whales, you don't have to get a baby because they're relatively small. It's just a matter of what do they look like? Do they look cool. Are they really pretty? No scarring. Yeah. Are they fresh looking? Yeah. Like less mangled individuals and then they will do babies as well. So that's one thing, like they totally could have survived for all we know. Well, the hope is that they did. Yeah. Um, But I I do are a couple cases of the ones he released did make it out and have survived. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the hard part is the is defining essentially when release makes sense and when rehoming makes sense yeah. um, like currently as is with a, like west is looking like a better option for a yeah while. well like all the dolphins at sea world san diego are pretty much besides a couple i could probably i could if i wanted to i probably name but most of the ones are not wild caught they're not even rescues at least like if i'm thinking of in dolphins they're bred, yeah. they're bred that's all they know they could learn to hunt a little bit but more like not that you would be re- they'd be dependent on it and able to survive yeah and then part of that too is humans are hum- humans are a part of their social life now they might very well inappropriate inappropriately seek out Interact humans people yeah even if they can hunt even if they can live on their own that's a liability because sure. dolphins can and will attack people especially ones that are very used to people <laughs> yeah i mean Part of me is like that sounds great <laughs> you know like the the, the ocean lover the dolphin lover the like diver in me is like um I don't see that as a problem <laughs> but yeah. the actual scientist in me and just you know logical human can definitely see where that can not only become a danger for people but also for the animal itself you know yeah. like for the example like where individuals did get struck by boats or you know things like of that nature so the too used to humans like that's the thing with like killer whales like even releasing the captive killer whales especially with the very aggressive history of some individuals Mm -hmm. and that they're very used to humans in the water i mean especially bottlenose are probably the most commonly sought after aquarium oh yeah dolphin they're not small really i mean oh they are large like yes they are small compared to an orca Mm -hmm. but they're not actually small yeah that they're big animals you know and very capable and have been documented in the wild and in captivity harming 
human, you know. There's so. tons of cases of captive bottlenose. Like my friend's been bit by one at SeaWorld because oh, there's yeah. petting. I mean, like it, it, it does not surprise me in the slightest. We, you know, our, I mean, yeah. if you've been listening to any of the past episodes where we discuss sharks and or dolphins and the comparison between the two, you know dolphins are that more we, intimidating. Yeah, that like dolphins are really smart and intelligent and can be very evil. So, and we've already talked about that, so we won't go yeah. into it again. But yeah, to your point, it could definitely be an issue if release was the option. Well, yeah, that's the thing when people are like, they should just release them. Part of it too is like, well, no, because because diving is also such a huge thing. Like if you release, I'm going to say like orchid. Orchid is, I love her, but she has, she is one of like the more aggressive killer whales in captivity Mm -hmm. to the point where they come across a diver. She may not swim away. Whereas a wild killer whale may just look and go away. Like they understand Mm -hmm. you're a human, you're not a threat and they leave you alone for the most part. There's obviously like, they'll come look at you. There's the only wild incident. Right. There's footage. There's footage of. Yeah. But she may not, she may come really close. She's used to being touched, used to being interactive and might be playful. Especially like for a person, I mean, even for me as someone extremely, I I would say on average, far more experienced in the ocean, interacting with large wildlife than probably the average person would still be incredibly intimidated to be approached by an orca. And also basically just have to accept my fate because there's nothing I'm going to do against an orca. Yeah. If they were just like, I'm going to play with you. And here's like play for an orca is not like, like, that's the thing. Like, I think I was talking to my mom once. She's like, why do big cats like kill people? Like, I'm like, part of it's probably said it's a lion when it's playing with you. It may be playing like a kitten, but it's like for sure. And I mean, five times bigger than you, your dog can get too rough. My dog bites me all the time. Yes, you do. <laughs> Luckily, she's most of the time gentle. But if she wants, like, play can get rough, mm-hmm. you know, with your pet, let alone a 30 something foot animal that weighs well, there's, pounds. There's footage of, so there is a dolphin in Scotland, I think, that has gone viral, kind of not viral recently, oh, but like, I know exactly what you're talking about. There's he's like super of- friendly with divers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like there's like two divers. The that images like, are gorgeous, but it's beautiful. like. She has footage of her attacking people. Yeah. And it's on YouTube and like, they've kind of renamed her as well to try and make it seem like a different dolphin. Mm. They'll touch her. They'll like dive and play with her. And they are beautiful images, but it's so reckless, especially knowing that dolphin has been aggressive with humans. Yeah. Yeah, it's just one thing where past the point, like people are like, well, they could totally learn to hunt. I'm like past that, let's think about the life they've had. They, it's not safe for anyone. Yeah, so in that point, like Rick's actions, maybe not the most. Yeah, the best defense is that it was early on. Yes. And he may have like known where they like, yeah. Give him the benefit of the doubt in that aspect. But some Uh, did go wrong. I think a dolphin did die at one point. Yeah. But, but at this yeah. point, that's not necessarily the most reasonable or viable option. Yeah, they're much better now. Like their Dolphin Project, Rick O'Berry do much better now. It was obviously yeah. something we all were learning from. Like Exactly. Oh, so wait, what did you think here. of the footage of the diver petting the dolphin? I, <laughs> I have mixed emotions. That's okay. Yeah, I watched so... it and I was like texting. I was like, oh, I know like. It's one of those things. I don't even know how to like explain it. I looked at my friend that I was watching with and I literally looked at her and I go, if I did that, I can't even explain to you how big of an a-hole I would get ripped. Like people would lose their minds if I were to share something like that. Um, I believe I know where they were. I believe they were in um, Bahamas area. So we That's what it, yeah. And bottom those dolphins. That's and what the, it that like. population is known to be extremely friendly and interactive with divers and just like in general um, with boats and things in that area. I am of the mindset where, and at least with sharks, I really try to. 
try not to force interactions if that makes sense yeah um don't get me wrong I definitely swim closer to sharks sometimes and like things like that you know but I try really hard not to I get like I try not to touch them unless I have to yeah well that's have I reached out when they were like within arm's length though yeah yeah well I think that my my thing is uh I'm definitely in the field of with megafauna Mm -hmm. partially because of how like I touch wildlife too I literally hold starfish and every other freaking post on Instagram so it's not like I'm not a flat out don't touch wildlife but for me when it comes to like megafauna um or just things that are not an invertebrate or like a fish to some regard like you know I'm more on the do not touch unless you have to and this was an area where I was like you did not have to touch that I understand why I totally understand why she did I I've been that close and it's so tempting but I would be like I could never feel good about myself for doing that because there are so many like like it, it looks very innocent but for all you know like that can create make that dolphin become more prone to interact with people it likes the belly rub it takes them out it then gets mad when they don't get one it's one of those things that it's like it's so innocent and it's so pure and I think it's beautiful but I'm also like you don't uh, know what the repercussions of it could be yeah yeah like it could start to condition that animal to like that's rewarding oh for sure I I wrote a blog about it a long time ago kind of on the controversy of touching wildlife specifically yeah to touch or not to touch Oh, <laughs> but that- I, wrote, I wrote a blog about it sort of just about the controversy involved in surround in touching wildlife in general and then sort of my personal rules that I've kind of set for myself at least specifically when it comes to sharks yeah. I will say on the cetacean front to be fair cetacean never really has given me the opportunity <laughs> to be close yeah. enough to touch it however I do feel as though that's not really an animal that I I think I could restrain myself enough you know and I think you could be aware of the desire but also like I don't know it's hard because like I look at that video and I'm like I wish that was me (laughs) oh totally I was like I want to do that I've pet a dolphin and kept it and so I think like from that aspect am I incredibly jealous of this magical moment that this diver spent with this dolphin yeah of course you kind of have to be crazy not to be um however I am kind of of the mindset where I think when it comes to cetaceans especially in particular you probably shouldn't touch them um also just because like I don't know a lot of the aggressive acts that have come from let's say things like pilot whales or other dolphin species that I have had the pleasure of interacting with in Hawaii are because people tried to touch them or did touch them yeah that was my other thing is like sharing it is not that like you should do it and not share it but sharing it then and this is something that even that I think there was a post recently that was going around about like just cetacean interactions in general above and below water but that encouraging even if you're like the poster's behavior is poster being like I post not like a poster the person who's posting (laughs) the like interaction footage picture may have been following every regulation dolphin totally came up but someone could look at that and be like I want that experience and go seek it out for sure and that is something that even within that that is an argument even with sharks you know that and I get it quite frankly I get it a lot where people dm me and they're like I want to pet a tiger shark. I want to pet a shark. I want to do this and that and the other thing. And I have to explain to them that don't do that. (laughs) You know? And obviously like I try and be really transparent with the fact that like, is that my favorite part of my job? Yeah. However, it's not something that and this is not every shark diver's philosophy I try my best to I try my best not to do that 
have I definitely in the past taken maybe a moment here and there where I'm like, Is you know, like, yes, I yeah. would be completely hypocritical to say that the rules I set for myself, I have followed to a T a hundred and never done anything else. Yeah. And that's just not true. Mm -hmm. Um, I do really strongly feel though, that I try my best to follow the rules I have set for myself in terms of like letting the wildlife come to me, doing it when necessary, not to force an interaction, that sort of thing. Um, and I'll link that blog post down below if you guys are wanting to read my personal rules or just, you know, read about that controversy in general. Well, That's like no like, shame to this diver. We, I get it. No, it's not something that I'm like, you're horrible. I would never do that. Um, I and, cannot and she does say I she's like, I just kind of put my hand out and it just like happened, you know? And yeah. I get that. I get it. I mean, I get it. Like, and, her, and to be fair, like she's probably, she was probably diving with these specific group of dolphins all day long. Yeah. You know, like it's just like more, this is more like a basis, like touching wild cetaceans for sure. And no shame to the lady. Yes. I definitely am on the fence where I'm like, I, I think that's a no, no in my book. Um, but an understandable, like we get why you did it. But yeah, but they, they talk a lot about like their plans, sort of what's going on. Um, they don't really get into the actual like footage and like setting out the cameras and stuff till kind of closer to the end of the documentary no I was kind of like come on come on yeah. let's go <laughs> I mean they brought up important stuff they talk about the IWC the International mm-hmm. Whaling Commission um Mercury Mercury and they start and they do sort of bring up the shadiness of the IWC mm-hmm. essentially um especially Japan's role in that in sort of not necessarily I don't want to say bribing but like kind of bribing yeah. other countries to join and vote in support and that's just like all class that's all government that's yeah that's the thing is like we can say that about probably and like in the u.s the meat industry is like has tons of lobbyists it's like horribly corrupt that's just politics yeah in general and the iwc Um, is politics it's not like run by the act like even when they asked the this those some like some of those people um what kind of whales are in your waters it's those They're things like, oh. where some people were probably just put in that position because the government's like oh we're a part of this we have to have someone you yeah no 100 percent. and it definitely brings up sort of that corruption within everything i did find it interesting and we we have talked about this i think when we went overseas spiracy it was relatively recently about the idea that because they talk about the mercury and they talk about how people kind of have an understanding that it's really not that good for you yet they continue to mislabel it and all those sorts of things which are it it was so funny to watch this and like just the parallels between like the dolphin slaughter fishing sort of industry and like the shark fishing industry there's a Mm. lot of parallels like mercury content mislabeling um basically like validating the fishing by like oh we're giving it away for free you mm-hmm. know like all those sorts Isn't that of what things. the tournaments will do i i know that there are people in florida that are like i killed this shark i'm feeding it to the first responders so it's okay yeah kind of thing it's like same kind of argument like oh we're gonna yeah. give dolphin to school children we're gonna give shark to first responders you know um so there were a lot of parallels in that yeah. sense I did find it interesting that like the whole pest idea came up again as like, well, we're not killing them just to kill, like we're not killing them just to eat. It's also because they're really annoying and they, and they go into this explanation of how there's all these officials are basically saying there's a correlation between the numbers of dolphins and our lowering fish stocks. And I literally was sitting there with my no. <laughs> head wanting to just explode because that's not where do we factor works. in where's the human factor it's not how it works and also okay the <sighs> this makes me so mad when people make this argument because i mean i know so much of it is just a misunderstanding and a lack of mm-hmm. education about like how ecosystems work 
and we see it with sharks too obviously like they kind of play similar roles dolphins and sharks as like more apex level predators but the thing that like outside of talking about how an ecosystem works and whatever it is the dolphins were always around even when we had better fish stocks so then we started killing the dolphins and the fish stocks also still continued to drop and drop and drop so how are we not looking at it and going huh what else has changed in this ecosystem potentially maybe it's not the dolphins because there's less dolphins and there's still less fish yeah that doesn't make sense and it just it boils my blood it makes me so mad that was my thing i was like humans play a fact like humans have been fishing coastal humans have been fishing for years so we know it's not just inherently humans it has been like the product like the furtherment of how we fish technology yeah yeah like it's not an argument that so many different issues shouldn't eat fish it's only for dolphins like obviously coastal people would eat fish it's that we've gotten really good at it in a bad way we've gotten really good in a bad way and we've overfished or just taken that stock way too much that then the dolphins may their competition becomes greater plus there's also an argument that the dolphins aren't really eating the tuna and that they show a tuna fishery yeah and like bluefin tuna hello you see how big those things get they're rivaling this the dolphins are eating smaller scale for the most part and my my point more so is like okay so we tried killing the dolphins and that (laughs) clearly didn't work so logically as humans we're just going to continue to kill the dolphins yeah that makes sense yeah and i mean it'll work eventually it'll get there yeah i don't know it's just incredibly frustrating and it's something that like probably hits home especially because it's not something we just see with dolphins it's something we see again as a parallel with sharks and just like there's too many sharks and humans Florida. hate to take the credit for the stuff that they're messing up but they love to take the credit for the good stuff that they do yeah and so i think it's just a lot of like oh it's not a, it, it's pointing the finger at something yeah. other than yourself essentially when it's easy because it's another apex predator too it's like it's the other apex predator it's not us yeah we don't have a massive food waste problem whereas dolphins don't where we throw out millions of pounds of fish a year that's fish for no reason <laughs> not us that's the it's them Ugh, it's it the sharks and the dolphins they're eating everything scream. it makes me so mad oh humans suck but humans are a part of the planet and we have yes. been we evolved here i think we didn't just be plopped down here randomly and we're an invasive species i think the we, problem with a lot of the education system we have in place right now is it's let's look at this ecosystem let's look at trophic cascades separate from humans yeah like i was not taught necessarily we we are taught as humans that we are above Mm -hmm. the ecosystem that we are somehow separate from every process that occurs on earth and i think unfortunately hmm? i thought of that audio of biden right now on tiktok where it's like there goes the economy yeah (laughs) like we're a part of it that's unfortunately i think that's kind of a one of the biggest disconnects when it comes to just science in general is that people have this idea that the actions that we have don't affect anything other than ourselves yeah we're we're very uh like a self-centered society in a way not necessarily like as individuals but i mean as a little bit as individuals Mm -hmm. but just as a human society in general we very rarely look at I mean look at just like climate change for so long why is it taking so much time for people to be like oh shoot yeah we might be causing that this might hurt us we we might be one well one we might have been the reason that happened and two Mm -hmm. eh, that might come back to bite us in the butt kind of thing it might you know it's definitely like 
there's de- I think what you said about we're when we're not involved in the picture, we think that we're above it. Yeah. And that's where I think that's a huge problem because humans can coexist with nature, mm-hmm. but we don't because we have started to remove ourselves, at least like from a very like westernized or just very first world country perspective. Yes. As we progress. and that, again, we are not talking about the nations or the communities and villages and things that are still very heavily oh yeah centered around well, like indigenous culture in ecosystem and things is, like that. we are we are yeah. not talking about that this is we very are talking much, yeah. about first world over consumerism type society Awfuls. yeah don't come at us that's not what we're talking Listen, about i did find it interesting that um when they brought up like the idea of subsidizing fishermen and saying hey it. we'll pay you not to do this and they chose not to um and they that's where they sort of begin talking about the whole pest issue that we already covered yeah but I found that really interesting I was like huh that is such an interest because I think at least for me a lot of what sort of helped me not to villainize the fishermen that are actually doing the act itself is because I've sort of been able to rationalize, well, this is what they have to do to put food on the table for their own family. Yeah. And so I think it was really shocking for me to hear that they had tried to offer some sort of monetary compensation not to do it and it was turned down. I wonder and if that may not like be the government subsidy that was more like gonna be like get like well they probably might be subsidized because even subsidies are eh. but like I wonder if theirs was like a time limit like oh we'll subsidize you for this long until you can find a new career or something yeah, it's one of those things I where think... I was like what's the full story yeah and I'm sure like, for like, all it was very know, well. the actual individual fishermen could very well have wanted to take those subsidies and it was their manager whoever's in charge yeah. of them that said no mm-hmm. you know so yeah, we didn't obviously get the, but it, we it's a, we didn't get every single, it's a better stuff. solution than other films have maybe presented where they actually went and said, we get it money. What if we yeah. helped with that? Yeah. Which I was I like, I like, I mean, that's kind of the idea behind like project Q, mm-hmm. you know, it's slightly different, but same general premise. It's, yeah. Of like providing an we get it. You're making money. I'm not taking that from you. Yeah. And, and I mean, I can't the project it. does similar things less yeah. through ecotourism and more through um, providing research. a different and research then, like, the, and also like the tuna fishery. Yeah. So yeah. same, but different, you know, but I did find it interesting that they were sort of opposed to that idea or at least appeared to be in the documentary. Um, and it would be interesting. I wonder if, because 2009 was a different time. Well, and like their catches have diminished extremely. So they kept saying they kill like 23,000 a year or something. And that is, they're killing like 600 a year now. Yeah. The Taiji drives have diminished a lot. And that could be too, because most aquaria nowadays are not necessarily getting wild capturing caught. anymore. Yeah. Well, part of it too is, I think with anything conservation wise, this is my thing with a lot of these films is and reading a reading blog post where they're like, a lot of change is going to come within Japan. It's going to come to places where things are happening because when you come in and I will say like as white people, because that is who came in this movie. Yeah. And it very much is, especially a lot of arguments made from Japanese people were like, okay, what about you and you killing beef here in Japan? Yeah. We never ate cow or horse. Yeah because we relied on seafood and our horses or whatever our terrestrial animals were things that we like were very and I definitely understand that argument that like it's not fair of western culture to point the finger and be like well just because you do it differently from us it's wrong yeah and just because our like we can't put dolphins in a slaughterhouse that was something else it's like they have to be killed in the cove if we are if they were like doing it for food kind of which there's some of it is food but like solely for food it's going to be done out in the open because there's not slaughterhouses where we can hide it. Yeah. That was something interesting too. And, but there are like, there obviously are hit pieces, hit, hit piece films on the meat industry now. Yeah. So it's being, it's now equal. It's being it has happened. <laughs> it has gone yeah. to us as well. I think too, it's, I, I wonder if, I wonder if now maybe those subsidies would be considered something more valuable had 
this film been done like post black fit or like post the decision to end captive breeding of like orcas. i think it'd be cool if they just redid it from like the new perspective because like yeah just like is in it and i think it'd be cool to include more of the japanese activists that are out there for sure that are a big part of it as well yeah because um that was definitely missing. didn't highlight that yeah yeah that was missing and there were people around but I think the documentary was definitely kind of one of the first of its kind and really I think it was the first gotcha nature documentary like it was very groundbreaking which is why it was so it was groundbreaking in the methods it was ground of filming it was groundbreaking and just like the style of documentary but I think it was probably one of the first actual coverages of Taiji on like mainstream media yeah I think was Facebook around in 2009 yeah so like yeah past like a couple social media sites and they weren't as huge like this was kind of the way they could get it out there Mm -hmm. uh and it did a good job dolphin project is huge now and like big celebrities backed up like harry styles is all about dolphin project i love harry styles um (laughs) Maisie williams goes and is a cove monitor she's Arya stark on game of thrones yeah so it's definitely become something i that people if nothing else at least know more about which is good um, and I think I think it'll phase out my, my my thing is like we don't need to colonize conservation and that's how a lot of these things feel when we're going into other countries because like how would we feel if a bunch of Japanese people came into like your local farm where maybe you slaughter a cow out in public but that's how you feed whatever yeah. how would you feel if they're in your face and it's like reversing it um have reversing it for anything any culture any kind of thing where you're killing something yeah where someone else is coming in and acting better than you for but sure we, but there's so many like now there's so many activists within japan that are fighting for it same with like hong kong with the shark industry yeah. like no it's, there's i think a big wave of change in areas that are known specifically for originating these sorts of um activities like dolphin slaughter or shark finning that are now like hey we don't all agree with this fyi yeah you know i've seen videos in i think taiwan where my, we, we did for my conservation biology class we had a whole day we talked about stuff like this and we sh- he showed a video of it was made by like some thai um college students i think and it was basically like say no to shark fin soup at your wedding at your graduation yeah don't do it like and it was like all hip and the kids were in on it and it was like a cool like That's trailer cool. commercial just like saying we love sharks we don't need to eat them do either like just don't do it or do imitation yeah. That's and cool. he was like things are changing Mm -hmm. and these places can do it without aggressors like i'll just say like sea shepherd yeah who's notorious and i would say like dolphin project to an extent at least in the beginning and other any organization that's like came in really hot and heavy like right 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 and uh, i guess then i guess my last kind of question for you yeah or just to discuss between us clearly like we like you mentioned the slaughter itself has at least decreased a lot in number, how frequently it's happening, all these sorts of things, but it's still going on. Mm -hmm. So how effective, I guess, do you think the documentary was ultimately? And what, what is it at this point? Do you think that is going to Do you think it'll ever stop? Do we think it's just now that we need to make it at a manageable level? Like what I guess is the answer from your perspective? I really would be interested to see the statistics of like yearly decreases in their catches since it came out. Cause I'm almost positive there's a bit, cause they were saying like they killed 23,000 a year which is wild to think about. Yeah, I wonder if that number was super accurate Mm -hmm. because now they really only kill like 600 and every year they they have a quota so they are only allowed to take capture kill certain amounts certain of certain number. species so that and i think that's more like oh we are man we're, lo- we're looking at the biodiversity of species but past that if it will stop i think eventually at least the captive drive can likely go mm-hmm. away a lot of that partially because china and russia and japan which all still have very i mean their their captive industry is booming right now it is not like how we were we're at the downfall of ours they're at the start and the rise yeah and that's part of it is it's i don't know how much can be done within there until like they get their own documentaries about those parks because there's only so much like 
as like a Westerner on Instagram is going to do how many of my For followers sure. are in Russia going to Moscovarium and yeah. seeing Nord and Narnia and all those killer whales. And luckily, like recently, Russia did put in a bill that they're not going to catch wild killer whales for a few years. That's that good. could change. And so, but then places are doing breeding programs. So maybe just with breeding, captive ones, stop, like wild ones stop getting caught. Yeah. I definitely think it, it can phase out. I think it's just that it's following its own course. I mean, we did yeah. the same and people were pro- protesting killer whale captures and the Florida dolphin captures and captures in Hawaii for mm-hmm. years. Hopefully. I hope that at some point we'll at least get to the point where Taiji doesn't occur for the captive trade. Yeah. I'm not sure we will ever get to a point where Taiji doesn't occur just for the slaughter of dolphins. Mm-hmm. The but like I their hope sustenance that, or pest control yeah, aspect. But I hope that if I mean who knows, with enough education, maybe. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's kind of interesting to see. And it's yeah. Like as I, I never I knew people were hope. against captivity from the beginning. Yeah. I never knew people were against captivity until I was a teenager in general. And I was blackfish came out for like years I didn't even know it existed yeah that's the thing is there's so many ways people just don't even know yeah and hopefully like with social media making information more accessible hopefully with younger generations of individuals growing up to points where they can influence legislation hopefully we'll see a change in Taiji and hopefully as captivity sort of eventually comes to more of a slow, not just here in the Western world, but in places like Japan, China, Russia, hopefully we'll see it end or at least come to a really diminished point. Yeah. I think it's going to be a really long time realistically before it completely goes away. Unless something big happened. Unless something really big happened. However, I do think that it is possible that younger generations could eventually end it all right well thank you guys so much for listening to this episode next time we are going to be discussing happy feet the first one um we'll eventually do the second one as well but there's lots of great topics in marine conservation in that movie and it's something a little bit more lighthearted than i'm ready for the dancing and yeah the, the, the very sexual the music. intro song <laughs> but yeah that's what we're going to be discussing next time so if you haven't seen it you definitely should watch it and then come back and join our conversation about it. But thank you guys so much for listening. We will see you next time. And yeah, bye. Adios.